Hi, I'm Robert Delena. Hi, I'm Ryan Delena, and you're listening to Ski Rex Media Podcast. How we doing, everybody? Tim from Ski Rex Media once again, and this week for the podcast, we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to take it easy on myself, but more so, I want to get this out because this past weekend, well, no, yes, this past weekend was the Snowbound Expo. I, dude, let me tell you something. That weekend whooped me. I was so tired. I was so achy because I'm not in shape, dude. I've been talking about it anyway. You've heard me talk about it on social media, if you follow me on social media, and on the um uh, podcast episode from the show floor that come out last week and that's all well and good and that's really awesome but while I was there and in that podcast we had the return of Robert and Ryan Delena authors of the father-son authors of Without Restraint How Skiing Saved My Son's Life awesome book great book they sold a bunch of books we know that Um, I wanted to get a little bit more out there from them. So what we're doing today is reusing old audio. I am reusing the podcast I recorded with them, the first one from the summer. Now, the diehard Ski Rex Media fans probably already heard this, um, and that's awesome. Please listen again. I guess you don't have to, but you can if you want. And I wanted to make sure other people heard it. The Ski Rex Media podcast obviously does more... um, I know I'm getting a lot of ums today, everybody. I'm still recovering from the expo. That's how awesome it was. It kicked the hell out of me, and it was amazing, and I loved it. No, seriously, though, um, I wanted to make sure this episode got heard by more people because I really like those guys. They really like me. I'm friends with them now. They're friends with me now. We had a lot of fun at the expo, chatting, hanging out, uh, doing the, you know, they were on the show floor they, they had time to do the show floor show as well, the show floor podcast, along with Brenna Huckabee and Steve Steep and Danny Hairston and LJ Enriquez and all kinds of other people. And it was a lot of fun, but I want to make sure they got the first one out where they talk about the book. So, yes, in the episode, I'm going to talk about the summer reading list. Ignore that <laughs> and just dig the interview if you haven't heard it before or listen to it again. That's how awesome those guys are. I think you'll really, really, really enjoy it. Before we get into that past audio, though, let me tell you all about Whaleback Mountain. Whaleback Mountain is in Enfield, New Hampshire, a big mountain in a small package. What does that mean? It means that right off the interstate, exit 16 off of I-89, you get Whaleback Mountain, which has a little bit of everything you could ever want in a small package, which means it's not, it means it, it doesn't mean anything. It's just small, but it's awesome. It is completely awesome. You want groomed trails? They'll give you groomed trails. You want natural stuff? Natural. They got it. They'll give it to you. You want trees? They got trees. You want nighttime? They got nighttime. You need to rent? They'll rent to you. They'll teach you how to do it. You want beers? They got beers. They even have their own beers. Whaleback Mountain is so awesome. So much to do with short lift lines and cheap lift tickets i think their biggest ticket won't even cost you on the weekend over 60 bucks it's under 60 bucks it might be around 50 i forget if the prices uh are still the same as they were last year or the year before that but check them out whaleback.com and you can find all that out go there you will love it plus this season they are a full indie pass partner so if you ride indie pass you have two days waiting for you at whaleback mountain plus the new lift Plus, I'm going to be there as a lifty so you can visit me. Plus, I'll be skiing there all the time anyway. I'm there so much because it is right up the road. It is my home mountain. Whaleback Mountain. Ski it to believe it. So here we go now. Robert Ryan Delena with me, Tim from Ski Rex Media, talking during the summer, but we're replaying it for you now since the Snowbound Expo just went by. Like I said, I was hanging out with those guys thinking about that, and I want to make sure everybody who can hear the episode does. So dig on this, and I'll see you on the other side. Now, we're here with, you know, the summer program. I don't usually do a summer program because I like to not work, but I figured why not work this season and keep the name going and everything. Plus, we all do stuff, skiers, snowboarders, what have you. We're all doing stuff. And part of that is the summer reading list. What are you reading? 
reading some fiction by Wendy Clinch? Are you reading some tips and trick books by uh, Caroline Elliott and Kim K? Are you reading 30 Years in a White Haze? Dan Egan, you all know who he is. Well, because of Dan Egan, I'm talking to two more authors who have quite the story. Robert Delena, his son, Ryan Delena. Gentlemen, how you doing? Thank you, Tim, for having us. Good to be here. It's funny that you mention um, the summer circuit. And like, what do skiers do in the summer? We need to do something. And I, cool. I realized when I became a climber, I'm like, I needed this so bad. My friend and I used to cross a swamp. It would take <laughs> all day. And that was like how we kept ourselves busy because we just sure. needed to occupy our bodies and minds. Absolutely, dude. That's 100% awesome that you said it and that you offered it up because there's people, they, they tell me all the time, they're like, what? You're such a skier, which I'm not. I'm not good. I don't do cool stuff like you guys. And we'll get into that and whatnot. And I'm awful. I couldn't keep up with you. Not even on a green. 100%. Maybe me. You might keep up with me, but not mm, right. Maybe. Well, it's funny. We, we, I was reading the book, which I, I, you know, I have the book in front of me for reference and I'm reading the Antarctica trip. Now, all right, here's the son of a gun here. I like the book. It's a great story, 100% going to suggest it to anybody. Great story, and it's kind of a lot of bang for your buck because it's almost like two books because of the way it's it's set up, and we'll get into that. But the trick of any interviewer, of any journalist, is to talk about the book without talking about it because I want people to read it. I don't want to ruin it. No spoilers, I think, is what the kids say these days. I don't know. Yep. Ryan, you mm -hmm. would know better. You're closer to kids than I am. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think that it's probably an old one. But I think it's like it's the one thing that hasn't changed. We haven't found a way to like make new slang for it. Totally. Totally, dude. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk. Let's talk first about the setup. Now, we have the same story coming from two different people. And when you read the book, it is set up. It is very specific. What is Robert saying? What is Ryan saying? How would you come up with the idea for that or why? And I think you do go into that in the book. So I'll let you balance out that answer. I think it was intentional. Um, I think originally we thought we would both write our parts and then we would meld it together. And then I saw it was an, it was an Alex Honnold book, Ryan. It was a climbing book. I yeah. Think it was. So it was originally our plan, I don't even know if you remember this because it was just so many drafts ago, but we were going to do it as like a two book in a box thing, okay. which like that would have been really hard to get a publisher to do. Sure. And at the time I was listening to Alex Honnold's alone on the wall and i'm like this is really interesting it's like it's like a book about him but it has excerpts from him about the stuff they're talking about and it's a really interesting juxtaposition because it's like he's so no big deal he'll talk about like free soloing 513 like sure. it's just like his backyard walk but then yeah. you pair that with like the guy who's writing it about him i forget his name and it's just like this was the most insane climb that ever happened and the community went crazy. So I was like, what if we did that with our book where it's like my perspective of like, these are the things that are happening to me. And then we sure. have his perspective as the parent. And that took a long time to perfect because we were redundant for a lot of it. Cause we didn't even read each other's versions when we started, we okay. wrote two separate books and then we showed each other what we wrote. And that was kind of crazy. That's awesome, though, because it worked out really, really well. Now, before I go too much further, the book is called Without Restraint, How Skiing Saved My Son's Life. So this is ski. We're talking skiing still in the summer, um, the summer reading list. Now, the story is ridiculously amazing. Like I said, and as Ryan explained, we have a couple different you know, it's not two versions of the same story. It's just two people telling it, which is great. It'd be like if you're sitting in the room talking to these two and just letting them, you know, bounce stuff off you. It's wonderful. Now, what? If you, you know, you can interpret the story in a lot of different ways. Now, if you're a New Englander, like I'm a New Englander, I grew up in New England. There's all kinds of stuff in here, little stuff. You know, we talk, just name your mountain. These guys mentioned it in the book. It's awesome. Massachusetts, uh, born and raised, you know, I won't get, I don't know where they live. So it's, that's not a worry, but you know, I'm not putting anybody in danger, honest, I swear. But you know, we're all New Englanders here. You know, so there's a lot of stuff like that. It was like, again, Dan Egan introduced Rob to Ski Rex Media, so that's how we are. So I'll reference 30 Years in a Way. Hey, same thing. You read that book, it's like, oh, New England, New England, New England, New England, New England. But the main story is about both of them. And that, that's what I was getting to. Pardon my going around and say, I'm under the weather. I'm sorry, everybody. It sucks. Um, but 
the story is about both of them. It's what Ryan went through as a kid and what Robert went through as a parent and how that all culminated in the end of the book, which I'm not going to give away. Robert, um, so the story you wanted to get across was being the parent and what that was like for you, correct? Yeah, so we have, you have this struggling kid, and we'll, we can you know come back to this, but Ryan was, sure. was, 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 was in a really tough spot as a kid. He was just a kid who didn't listen to grown-ups, and he, made, he was a really fun kid to parent for that reason, but when he got to schools... Excuse me. The schools were really didn't know what to do with them, didn't know how to handle them. Uh, you know, fast forward a little bit, the public schools eventually threw up their hands and sort of gave up and, and pushed him into these therapeutic schools, which were a disaster. He was restrained. I mean, that's where without restraint comes from. He was restrained every day at school, sometimes multiple times a day, pushed medication, eventually was uh, we, was recommended into a mental hospital to manipulate his meds even more. And just at the point as a parent where we we were just sort of out of moves, you know, we used to try to find activities to get him out of the house when things would go wrong. And I, I skied very little as a kid, a couple YMCA bus trips from Revere, Mass to uh, Bradford Hill. And I was a baseball player, gave up skiing, never wanted to get hurt. So I hadn't skied in 25 years and was just desperate for something to do with him. And, and one day I said, Ryan, let's get out of here. Do you want to go skiing? Neshoba is about 45 minutes from our house. We drove to Neshoba and I mean, we'll, we'll get back into the Neshoba piece, but Neshoba led to Wachusett, led to Loon, led to Vail, led to, you know, Stowe, led to Vail, you know, and eventually we get to Antarctica 10 years later. So, you know, here are these two beginners who just start this random journey, find this thing that he loves. I can see that he loves it. And as a father, I just wanted to put him in a position at least once a week where he was happy because the rest of the week, you know, when he was at school, he was in a pretty miserable place. And, and it sure. was... And really, in the beginning, it was just finding something where he could be happy for a few minutes, a few hours a day. What I realized in watching him be happy was that everybody was wrong about him. And what I needed was to take that happy kid back to regular life. And that could be the real Ryan. It sure. wasn't just the ski Ryan and, and, the, and the school Ryan. The school Ryan was wrong about Ryan from the start. The doctors were wrong about Ryan from the start. I was wrong about Ryan from the start. My wife was wrong about Ryan from the start. I would have never seen it had we not gone skiing at Neshoba that day. Sure. And that that's where the book picks up pretty much. I mean, that that whole uh, explanation he gave was really a short um, introduction to what the first several chapters, which you get into in more detail. And I'll come back to that as well. Ryan, your your memory of this is as absolutely amazing because you seem to remember so much. Now, for some of us, we make the joke about how we can't remember what happened yesterday. But, dude, you you got. Like your whole life is in there, man. What what is that like? And then putting it putting it on paper to be able to keep it again. Some of us can't remember what happened yesterday. Go it's ahead. honestly, it's fantastic because in the life that I lead, it's really useful. Because like you know, great example. I was just with a couple of friends and we were talking about uh, a climb um, at Cathedral Ledge, and okay. I hadn't done it in like two years, and I can still remember every move. I can still remember what the crux foot feels like and how you shift your weight onto it. And it's a bit of a gift and a curse because there's some stuff I don't want to remember that like sure. I can still remember it and feel it like it happened yesterday. Um, so it's, you know, it, like I said, it's a gift and a curse, but I've always had this very unique memory that it works in sequence. So sure. anything that goes in a chain of events where if I can remember one, it'll trigger the rest. It's almost like I have filing cabinets and I sure. flip through them by letter. And then when I pull on that letter, it'll expand hundreds of files. So sure. song lyrics, climbing moves, um, the trails um, with the splits in order to get to like a ski line um, or like all the trails at Loon Mountain, you know, things of that sort. I can remember all that. But if you just give me a random date, like, hey, Ryan, on the 24th, you have this phone call. I need to put it in my calendar before sure. I walk to the next room because it's okay. not connected to anything. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you think <laughs> about it, though, a life is just one long series of events. It's just one long sequence that you are constantly living in and adding to. So it, it made it easy for me to recall things for the book. Absolutely, dude. And again, you both did a great job writing it. Um, you know, it, it's very easy to follow. Um, it has so much extra information. Like I'm running through now things I have had friends, ex-wife, 
girlfriends who were in the education system were teachers. So a lot of what I saw at the beginning, like IEP, all this stuff, I know what that is, but not everybody might, man. You got it laid out in, in, in footnotes and, and, and Robert says, and then the story picks up and Ryan fills in that gap, man. Very accessible. Um, is that just the way it worked out or was that the plan from the beginning? I think I, I felt the need to write it that way. I mean, I'm a pretty, I, people always say you, you write like you talk. I just write like, like I'm telling the story. And if I was telling you the story and you, and you said, I just met Ryan. He seems like this most squared away kid. He's so bright. And, and I said, well, he was in a mental hospital. He was in these terrible schools and he was a kid. You'd say, how the hell did that happen? What, what went wrong? It really was just this little series of baby steps and bad decisions that we made early on. And if I didn't really explain each step, you'd think I was a terrible parent. And I, and I, you know, part of me says, yes, there were times when I, you could say I was a terrible parent for the decisions I made, but you know, here's why this doctor said this, or here's why this, this teacher told us to do it this way and why we thought it was the right move. And that's, you know, that, mm -hmm. that's, that's why I think it was worth explaining in that level of detail because it's, you know, it wasn't just one thing. It was just, just if I, I can piece back to this original story when a doctor uh, visited Ryan's preschool after day one, the preschool said, Ryan's different than the other kids. He doesn't want to play the other kids. He's fixated with this big sink in the room. He just wants to fill the sink and watch it drain. You know, and they, they, they were screening him out for autism at that point. They thought he may be sure. autistic. So they had this pediatric neuropsychologist come and observe him. And after she observed him playing for a couple of hours, she met with my wife and I, and she took this yellow legal pad out and drew an oval and a, a bisected the oval down the middle and said, Ryan's really smart in the left half of his brain and really weak in the right half of his brain. Now, how she could determine that after watching him play for a couple of hours, I have no idea. But it made sense given our profile and, and you know, the way he sort of was as a little toddler. But that one little oval, you know, dictated the next 10 years of his life. And so I, I think that's why in the book, it's important to lay out each step and say, you know, we're just people. My wife and I are both lawyers. We're smart people. We, we were good parents. And look where we ended up. Look at the mistakes we made. Imagine poor people who are, you know, single parents or, or you know, did all the resources we did. You know, how easily you could be led astray and end up in a, in a really, a really awful system. So I think that's it's, maybe, it's, maybe it was guilt is why I was explaining it so much. But I, I hopefully I did a good job explaining it. It's weird, too, because it's not even based on resources. It's, it's, it's education and the personality type to question things, which sure. I probably got from him. Um, but it's like, you know, there, there's parents who could probably afford way more like intensive care than we could have even thought of who, like, if you just like told them, this is the right thing to do. They just be like, yes, you're the experts. And they sure. wouldn't ask. They would just assume that like, it must not be working and they must need to go more intense with the kid because like they're only getting worse. They might not even have the type of personality to think you know, what if all these like wackos in the hospital are wrong? Like he keeps getting worse because what they're doing is wrong. Like that takes a certain type of person to, to question. And if you don't have that, like there's so many kids who probably could be doing fine, but are in like not good places just because they were unlucky to have parents who didn't question things. Like, And that's a great point. And I wouldn't have questioned it, Ryan, unless I saw you ski. Once I saw you ski, <laughs> I had evidence that you were different than everybody else thought. And I could go back to them and say, well, he's on a mountain. He, you know, they wouldn't let him go to the bathroom at school without a teacher following him into the bathroom. And I would say, we just flew to Utah. We stayed in a hotel. He skied the whole mountain. I can't ski with him. So I had to leave him half the day on top of Snowbird, hope he find his way down. He's, you know, eight, nine years old, 10 years old. And he manages that. And then we stayed in the hotel and we flew back. Why can't this kid go to class like everybody else to explain to me? So I, I had a little bit of evidence then, finally. And then my natural instincts took over. Like Ryan said, I questioned mm -hmm. everything. And I, I, I'm from Revere, so I, I doubt everybody. And I think everybody has an <laughs> angle that they're trying to work me, you know. So <laughs> that's, that's my nature took over, finally. You know what? That's I think that's one of the reasons I really got into the book was – it wasn't an act of out and out defiance. Roberts just not being a dick just for the sake of being a dick. Pardon my language. Mm -hmm. He saw something. He asked the question. His wife asked the questions. Question everyone. I'm with that. And I've never even been to Revere, Massachusetts. I think I might have been there once. But, you know, um, I, I'm all about that. I'm all about questioning the system. I'm all about questioning the education system. I'm very big on that myself. So I was really connected with that. I was like, all right, I see it. I see what you're saying. And I see right. Because, and you do this in the book too, and this actually comes back around near the end of the book. You, you, you don't, you don't fault 
or have any hatred or any uh, uh um you know you don't any bad feelings no hard feelings towards the professionals because the professionals are doing their job they're people your parents doing your job you're just people ryan's just people i'm just some dumb guy talking into a microphone we're all just people so these things can happen but the beauty of it is that because you did see it because you did question it you ended up going on and, and figuring out hey I, I want my boy to do this, and then he does that, and then now there's this whole story um, of things that, you know, it's really amazing. People, do you ever get, even to this day, when when people are reading the book, when you tell the story, and Ryan, you can start with this one, do people give you the stick? Like, are there haters? I mean, there's always haters, but are people like giving you any crap? Like, he's disabled, he's on the spectrum, he's blah, 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 stereotype this, stereotype that. Like, do people give you shit? Pardon my language. No. Um- <laughs> And I think part of it is I, I haven't met people who knew the book before they knew me. So uh-huh. I'm I'm a little bit of a chameleon because it's just like I don't lead my interactions with people like, hey, I'm Ryan. I was in a mental hospital this one time. Like, totally. oh, I tried to jump out of a window to escape the mental hospital. And like, you know, I lead with, you know, just getting to know people. And then we climb together. And like a lot of times I get to know people really fast through skiing and through climbing through hiking because you spend a lot of time in like intense situations where you have to communicate with each other. You're on adventures together. And sometimes you have nine hours where all you have to do is talk to each other. So we know each other pretty well. And then this bombshell kind of gets dropped on them and they're like, Oh my God, like how are you, you after going through all of this? I'm like, well, if you finish the book, I guess you'll find out. But there you go. Um, Stella book. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, it's one of those things where I think if they form their opinion of me before they read it, it's a lot easier to kind of accept it. Okay. Interesting. But Tim, you, Tim, you make a great point. I mean, when we decided to write the book, I mean, Ryan, don't forget, was 17, I think, when I proposed this to him. And I sure. knew I knew I would expose myself to all the mistakes I made. And people would judge me as a parent. And, but, you know, I'm 50 years old and I don't give a shit what they think of me. It's, you know, it's, it's too late. You know, I'm not going to change. But he was at a point in his life where he, he had now gone to college. He could have left all this in the rear view and, and, and buried it. And a few people in our town would have known. A few people in our family would have known what he went through. But that would have been it. He could have just gone on with his life. And to expose himself, you know, to, to the whole story and say, you know, this is what I went through and look where I am. The reason he did it, and I think, you know, it's just a testament to him, was because he thought other kids would benefit from hearing his story. And and he was willing Perfect. to expose himself to that kind of scrutiny. And it, 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 it says a lot about him. It says a lot about you both. Go ahead, Ryan. Were you about to say something? Yeah. Um, I mean, he kind of covered it. But it was like, yeah, that was kind of the thing. It's like you, when you get to college, like nobody knows who you are. And this is like one of the things when we t- talk about the book, like when you live in a town, I, I went back to high school. I got back sure. to public school after this long fight to get out of this this um, system. And then everybody knew each other for so long. They thought I moved from a different town. And it yeah. was like, I always had to have this awkward exchange with people of like, oh, I didn't move. I'm from Sudbury. And they're like, oh, well, why haven't we seen you around here? And I'm like, I went to a different school. And they're like, oh, is it like a private school? I'm like, yeah, sort of. I try to play it off like I was uh, I was smart. Um, totally. it, was, it was funny. They had this thing. Uh, I was in the Excel program, which was like for like you had a special homeroom where sure. you went in and like you could do a study hall with like people sort of supervising. A lot of kids who had anxiety or depression were kind of in it. Sure, but, sure. Um, Excel was also the abbreviation for accelerated, which was like the smart kids classes. Okay. So like people would be like, oh, who's your um, psychology teacher? Because you also had to take a psychology class with the Excel class. Sure. I'm like, oh, it was um, Tracy Lopez. And like, I haven't heard of that teacher. And I'm like, oh, she does Excel psych. And they're like, I didn't even know they did Excel psych. I'm like, yeah, yeah, they do it, you know. <laughs> dude, that's <laughs> so like, good. God, you're really smart to get into it. <laughs> that's so good, dude. That is but, incredible. Yeah, it was just, I hated that because it's like. It, I, I'm making it sound like I'm super slick now, but I don't like to lie to people. I like to be genuine. Sure. And it was stressful to keep that lie up because I always had to be so conscious to not go too deep with people in case they would discover this thing. And when we did the book, I agreed to it, but like I had a lot 
of thoughts where I'm like, this could be the end of me. I could be looking back on my life. Like if it wasn't for that book, everything yeah. would have out fine. <laughs> and the, it came time to announce it. And I literally, I, it took me an hour to write the Instagram post. I went back okay. and forth back. I was like hovering over the button for 20 minutes of the hour. And then I pushed it and I just watched so much positivity come through. It sure. really took some weight off my shoulders. And I want to like have other people know this because it's like, it's so easy to perceive it through your own lens because you judge yourself the most harshly. And I was totally. looking through the eyes of myself being my worst critic of just like, oh my God, all this happened to you? What's wrong with you? Are you like a crazy person? You're so different. Like you'll never fit in. And I can, I kind of projected that onto every other person before I'd even heard their own thoughts. Sure. And their thoughts were all positive of like, oh my God, you, I can't believe you overcame that. You know, that's so special. So just like take some weight off of your shoulders. Like people aren't going to judge you for what you went through. And if they do, they're weirdos and they probably got their own shit going on. Yeah, dude, 100% agree. Love it. Love your thought process on that. I personally am not a judging person. I don't care. I have a past. Um, we all do. You know, who cares? Whatever. I don't care. You're you're extreme Ryan to me. Uh, what do I know? I, I read the book. You're the guy who signed my book. It's so cool. <laughs> That's right, everybody. Another signed copy to add to the shelf. I have five now. Awesome. Not five Wait. of this print book, just five of different books. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I could do five of this. That'd be cool. I got a but box anyway. of them if you know more. Don't just say the word. Yes. Awesome. Um, but <laughs> uh, that's, again, I agree with you 100%. And I'm glad it's been a positive experience because it can be a positive experience more and more. Um, you know, and there's so many different things you could take out of it because it's not just about what Ryan does. And again, they've gone into bits and pieces, and I'm not going to spoil every single piece because i want you to read the book cause it's a great story but there's other things you can take out of it like i said if you're a new england nerd new england's all about it uh but if you you know it has you know this run that run from out west this run that one from us down south this one that run from antarctica um a place most of us will never even think about going especially me i get seasick dude let me tell you something there was one part of this book i, I don't want to forget this because it made me laugh, but I'm reading about your first night on the boat, and I was getting seasick reading it because you were talking about other people getting seasick. So that's how good the book is. It puts you right in the moment because I was sitting there like, oh, dude, no, close this for a minute. No, no, no. When you're on the boat, you kind of come out of the Beagle Channel, which is this calm water, and it happens about like 1030 after you've had lots of dinner, and it lulls you into this false sense of security. And as soon as you pass Cape Horn, I remember just watching my feet go what looked like four feet above my head while I was laying in bed. Sure. And I'm like, oh, God, it's starting. And it oh, doesn't dude. stop. Dude. And yeah. it, it's, it's so funny, like, because we went back to Antarctica. This isn't in, in the book, unfortunately. I, I wish it was. Um, but I, I uh, got invited to tail guide um, uh, on that trip. And it's just like, you think about, like, you know, your heroes become your friends. Like, sure. I was laying couch like so seasick and like chris davenport walks by and shakes me awake and it's just like hey man you okay you want a drama mean it's like this is like this guy who's like skied all the 14ers in the year just this incredible athlete and he's like you know like hey man you doing all right like can i help you out <laughs> totally and the thing with Davenport is I saw him speak once. I was in the same bar watching him say, say something. He was doing a presentation, and he was talking about the Everest climb. And I'm like, bro, I can't even go to the top of Mount Washington without getting a headache. I can't talk to this guy about anything. <laughs> and I, let me tell you something. These guys in this book, and that's another part of it. Again, it's not just one story. It's a ton of stories. These guys are adventurers. They've been everywhere. And I remember this past year, Dan Egan's like, hey, are you going to be able to make the uh, – the, the the hall of fame uh out in big sky i was like probably not because i have to be there for three extra days because town is at eight thousand feet um <laughs> and i found out about altitude while i was living in nevada i was like whoa altitude sickness is a very real thing <laughs> very real in the adventure that you guys take it's like it seems like you guys are just bouncing all over but how the hell do you do that 
either of you can answer that. I know well, it's kind of I kind of bounce topics here, yeah, but you know, no, since we're just going I'll at do it, it from my it. from my perspective, it's it's almost an embarrassment. I mean, I'm like the Forrest Gump of skiers because I've I've just been around the world's greatest skiers through really through accident and happenstance somewhat. I mean, but it really one led to the other. We started with a guide in Big Sky who's a big part of the story. His name is Ben Brousseau. And Ben was uh, took Ryan down Big Kular, and he was the first guide who didn't question his size or his, his age. He just he looked at Ryan and said, "What do you want to ski, Big Kular? Let's do it. You know, let's let's go do it." And and Ben became a, a, an integral friend, and that led us down to Chile with uh, the Nastic group. We met Chris Fellows, who's a legendary instructor. Um, you know, that eventually led to meeting Davenport, and Davenport introduced us to the concept of Antarctica. And then we circled back with Ben and end up in Antarctica. We meet Doug Stout. John Egan's on the trip. Uh, we eventually meet Dan Egan, and we it's just and I've skied with all of these guys. I'm an intermediate skier. Or I'm pretty good skier, I, and I've I've just had this you know whirlwind of experience with these legendary people. But from a dad standpoint, each one of them that I met, a lot you know they all said the same thing. I was a kid like Ryan. I was a kid that couldn't sit still. I was a kid that just wanted to ski. I wanted to get out of the classroom. I was misunderstood, and I was particularly John Egan, you know, and I and it really was relatable to me and said. You know what? Ryan's not just going to be okay. I've got him out of this terrible system. He's found this thing he likes. He can do this for a living. This could be his career. And he's going to see the world and take clients up these places because these guys are doing that. And, I, and I'm one of those clients. So it's, it was, it, it's been a, a cool run for me as well. But I'll let Ryan chime in from, from his side of the story. Yeah. I mean, I think that covers it. I, my answer is a little shorter, but it really, <laughs> um, it's a lot about just like the people you meet and these connections. Cause like each one along the way really uh, gave me the integral, the integral pieces of being a good skier, you know? Um, and they also opened my eyes to things that I wasn't thinking about. Like you can't find some of this stuff with a Google search. It's just like, what people ski in Antarctica? Like, how do you yeah. do that? And then, like, oh, yeah, you, 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 there's this and this person, and then the, tri the trip runs at this time. And, like, the the ladder goes further and further into oblivion uh, the further you go. Because now it's like, I recently just came back from Baffin Island, and, like, there's not even a trip that goes there. You have to, like, you have to get your own plane, and you have to contact, like, locals on the ground to snowmobile you in and leave you on the ice. And someone who can get you a gun because there's polar bears, like all of these experiences each place has like a person who like that's their thing they go there um or they know how to do it <clears throat> and it's so weird when you start chasing the ski dream you're just going to start meeting these people and the more opportunities you say yes to the more things you learn about that you didn't know were there <laughs> And that, that Baffin trip was, was Brennan Lagasse, who was, who we saw, we met on, on the Antarctica trip and, uh, we, you know, Todd Offenbacher, who and Ryan ended up with Andrew Eisenstarker and Todd and Angela Hawes, and these legendary instructors in Svalbard. So, you know, it all starts with this one day at Neshoba and it ends, you know, he's, he's been in the North Pole and the South Pole, basically. He skied all over the world and it's, it's, you know, it's, and it's it, because and it of these people. The show, but, but it really starts with Ben because, you, you know, if sure. it, we wouldn't know about Antarctica if we didn't go to Portillo and yeah. we wouldn't have known about Portillo if we didn't meet Ben. You know, I think it's like, I could totally see a scenario where like, if we don't get Ben on that day, yeah. you know, I, I, I probably would ski pretty hard. I was always into performance, but like the, the ski safari of the world thing probably doesn't happen. Or if it does, it happens to a much smaller degree or in a different way. Um, and it's cool because it's not like it was a stepping stone. You know, Ben has been a part of that ride um, for pretty much all of it. He got to come on that second trip that we just did where I was tail guiding and um, he was with, with dad and that was a cool victory lap, you know, like this person who's been such a huge part of my whole teenage into adult life got to come see Antarctica, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And Tim, you probably have a lot of instructors that listen to this, but we had hired instru an instructor in Snowbird and it was a disaster. We had hired an instructor at, at Jackson Hole and it was somewhat of a disaster. And then the only reason I, I probably would have given up on hiring somebody, but, but he wanted to ski Big Kular and I couldn't do it. I wasn't at that level and you needed to go with a partner. So I knew his only chance of doing this, and he was 12, 12 years old at the time, was, was to, to hire somebody. And I called the ski school and 
I didn't want to give away too much, but I said, you know, my son's a little complicated. I need, I need the right guy. And they give us Ben and, and His favorite word, complicated. It, complicated. You are that's that's using that term loosely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so we, complicated awesome. Ryan ended up with Ben that day. And Ben oh, they did one so or two good. practice runs and they end up doing big Pilar and, and that was it. And that you know, that that level of trust just developed right off the bat and, and Ben I just had a real I think instinctive ability to look at a kid and say, you know what, if he says he can do it and I, I watch him, I think he can do it. Why shouldn't he try it? You know, what's, what's, what are we doing here if we're not going to take risk? Because, you know, we're, this is why we love this sport. You know, it's, it's that thrill. It's, it's, you know, you know, it's, it's risk, you know, within, within a defined system and making good choices. But, you know, he took, he took a look at Ryan and Ryan was as good as any 45 year old going down that. So what if he's 12 years old? And that, and that was the difference I think with Ben and other instructors we've met. And that's another amazing part of the story. With any story, and you learn this in film studies classes, is where I learned it. Um, and I, I don't go into it much, but what interpretation, what can someone take away from it? And you, you get into, you start watching, well, you start reading, excuse me, about Ryan, how he's having his issues. But at the same time, once you're on snow and you get to that part of the story, it's this whole other positive vibe. I, I don't mean to use the word vibe, but, you know, for lack of a better word, it's this whole positive vibe. And, um, I mean, for me personally, he's 12 out skiing this stuff. I didn't even put skis on until I was 12, and I was skiing down <laughs> at Brattleboro on our local hill. What do I know, you know? Um, but, man, it, 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 the whole story, it, it, it feels negative for a moment, and then you start to get it. You start to, like, all right. There was some negative things, which is just life, whatever, you know, it, it, it really just a story of, a, I don't want to say everyday story because, you know, I don't want to take away from it, but you know, just people doing people things. And this one just happens to roll around skiing and Tora bright dancing on a table on a boat. I couldn't get over that story myself. <laughs> That's right. Since we were name dropping before I had yeah. to, that one sticks in my head. Yeah, I love her. her. I always yeah. have. Yeah. She's great. Oh, she's super so fun. Cool that you know so nice. Her. Yeah. So nice. Great. great. I, I'll, Dude, she she's from like my era. Yeah. We like, didn't, we didn't know who she was. I had a Googler. Like, we heard she was on the trip, and I was like, Really? This, she's won a gold medal in her. Like, this is a, she's a big deal. Holy cow. And totally. Couldn't she's, have been nicer. Super she's nice. from my era. Like, I'm yeah. closer in age to your dad than you, right? Like, I'm 44. So that whole era and the era prior to that, like, all right, let's do some more name drop and screw it. I knew Kelly Clark before anybody else knew who she was. Yeah. All right, that's yep. an exaggeration. Yeah. She was at Mount Snow. I worked at Mount Snow. I grew up in southern Vermont. We nodded. We said hello. Yeah. We all knew who she was. Like, damn, she's really good. And then we're driving around in our cars a few years later. Hey, she just won a gold medal, too. I was like, holy shit, look at that. Yo, that's hometown amazing. hero. Anyway, enough of the silly stuff, the yeah. name dropping, because I could do it all day. That's my favorite dumb bit. Yeah. I was like, you're really a name dropper. I'm like, no, <laughs> it's so much fun for me. Um, now I get to name drop these yeah. two as well. But anyway, the positive part of the story, and it really does, I don't mean to uh, take away from it, so don't misunderstand, but by the time you get to Antarctica, you've almost forgotten the first half of the story. Like, here's this kid who was going through the system, he has his issues, his parents are trying to deal with it, professionals are trying to deal with it, everything, whatever. Please pardon if you can hear the thunder. I don't mean for that to get on the microphone. I tried. Um, but you go through this, but then you get to Anna Carter. You've totally forgotten. It's now just an adventure story. Now, that can't be life for either of you. Like, you obviously are never going to forget. But at the same time, it does it kind of feel like that. Like, you've now moved from all of that, and you did touch on this earlier in the interview, but... You know, it, it, in the book, it, it seems presented like that, yet, you know, you guys can't forget. Do you understand what I'm saying? Can you answer that? Because I'm not even sure I'm asking the right I, question. I, I'll take a shot. I think one of the parts of the book, you know, when you get to Antarctica by that point, from a ski standpoint, he's gone from point A to point Z, and, and there's no stopping him. Sure. Life was still, you know, anybody's life. At this point, he, we finally got Ryan back to public school. He was, he was in Lincoln Sudbury High School. It, that was no picnic either, because now, not for the reasons before he wasn't being restrained, he was off all medication. We had, we had sort of come to the point where we realized he was just a regular kid and, and we had, all the decisions before were incorrect. But he still had to show up every day at a public high school, make friends, try to find a girlfriend. I mean, all of those things we all go through. You know, you want to fit in. You want to be cool. That's a stressful in existence. And he had no ramp up time for that. He just all of a sudden gets plopped into public school and says, go, go make some friends, you know, and so. There were days that were tough. There was, especially that junior year, it was, it wasn't that easy. So I think you're right. There was, 
in mm. the metaphor of skiing, you know, there are some days that, that, that aren't perfect. There's some days mm. you can fall down, you have to get back up. So what do you think? Totally. Ahead, it's, it, it was definitely like that. I mean, I guess I'll, t- I'll try and take a crack at what I think your question was. I mean, no, you don't forget the beginning because it's all, it's all the pieces that build a human. I don't think I would appreciate things the way I do if I didn't come from that place of darkness. Um, and it really, it's, it's tricky. Cause yeah, um, he's right. And you forget about that. Like until now, I don't think the, the parts of my life, um, the ski and the home ran synonymously. Um, I did have that moment of like, I was sitting, um, in Atlanta, like getting ready to do the next flight to Argentina to then go to Antarctica. You know, it's a long travel and sure. I was just like kind of hunched over my phone, kind of sad because we had senior dress up day and um, everybody else had a group and you go in like a teams of like a themed costume. Like everyone will go as like the Super Mario characters or everyone will go as like, I don't know, the, the all the mean girls, you know, something like that. Um, and I didn't have a team and I, I went in all my ski gear and, you know, made it look like I was about to alpine climb the school and then like, you know, ski off the roof. But been awesome. that was fun. People liked it. But deep down, I'm like, damn, like, I'm just I'm not part of that. I don't have a crew. And it's it's weird. It's just like you look at it. It's easy to look at that from that perspective. Of how could you want anything else in life? You get to do all these amazing things. But it's just like there's still that part of you when you're a teenager. That's like, you know, I want to I want to be normal. I love what I have. I'll like never sacrifice this craft that I've spent so long building for anything. But like man, you do want to be normal sometimes and sure. you wish you could, you, you, you wish it would translate. You know, it's like, I didn't grow up in a ski town. Mm-hmm. Ski in Antarctica didn't get you anything. You know, mm-hmm. the, the kid who can throw a football on the field that's in our town yeah. is so much cooler than me in our town. That's awesome. That's exactly, you, <laughs> you, you hit it right what I was going for, which awesome. Thank you. My goodness. Oh, you guys should have stuck out, whole held out for a better interview. Or my God, no, um, great. Um, but yeah, no, you hit it. You know, and that's another big part of the story that I, that I do love is you know you go through what Ryan went through, but then you go through what Ryan went through, what we all go through when we're in that god awful hole mm-hmm. high school. <laughs> you know, and yep. we all have our own experiences. Some are similar for different reasons. Some are different. You know, I went to a school with forty kids graduating. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a big difference. My sister graduated with eight kids, it's an even oh. smaller school. So, you and that know, comes with its own challenges. Mm-hmm. Oh, totally. Totally. It does. But you overcame, you adapted. Um, you've done better than some people. Like some people fold under pressure. Other people, you know, they love it. I don't know why. You know, I'm one or the other. Um, Actually, I don't think I was ever a folder under pressure. Even really, I just got angry quickly. Mm-hmm. Whatever. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I'm good now. Fun. Yeah, Tim the exactly. fun guy. Exactly. But well, you, you found something you love and you, you're good at it. And I think with Ryan was once he found this skiing, it was he was the easiest kid in the world to parent. He went from the hardest to the easiest because he had a passion and he had something to, to strive for. I mean, I, I have a daughter who's Ryan, Ryan's sister, you know, is 15, 16 months younger. And, you know, she's led a much more traditional life, much more traditional path, uh, you know, private school, good college, you know, the whole nine. But she's, you know, I think she's found something she's into, but I'm not 100 percent sure yet. So I, I find myself worrying much more about her than I than I do him. So it's 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 one of the lessons, you know, if you there find you something go, and you love it and do it every day. I'm a little more sure about her. I don't yeah, know. It's getting like, there, too. I mean, it'll depend what she gets. But like, you know, nope, nobody like goes into ecology to like make their parents happy. If she was like, Oh, I'm just going to be a lawyer. I'd be like, Oh no. But like, she's always been into animals. I was terrified of dogs as a kid. And I don't know why. And she wanted a living thing that could walk in our house. Didn't care what it was. A dog, a cat, (laughs) since we were like three. So she's on the right track. I think. Awesome. I love animals. So I 100% support it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know what's interesting though, and you you brought up how you know in the town you lived in, you know, the the guy who's skiing in Antarctica isn't as cool as the quarterback. Okay, in a ski town, obviously that is going to change. And 
you were coming up like, for example, you were coming up in the early 2000s. So the Internet was just getting there. You know, you started your YouTube channel. I kind of felt like it was back at the beginning, back when the Internet was not the Wild West like it was back in my day in the late 90s where, good Lord, I can, I've can i seen things I can't unsee. And, <laughs> you know, oh, it's awful what's bouncing around in here. It's terrible. The Internet's an awful place, dude. Everybody stay away from it except for Skirex Media and SkirexMedia.com. Check that out. But do you think if you came along later, like – well, like, for instance, you all know who Kai Jones is. He was 11 years old, and everybody in the world knew who he was. He was the coolest thing on two skis, yeah. but he come along later. Do you think if you come along later, your, your experience, at least from the celebrity part of it, do you think that would have changed at all? Um, No, because uh, Kai Jones it was 11 when I was 18. And he was already so much better than me. <laughs> and that that's part of why he got famous. You know, it's like sure. there's all the tactics. There's like, you know, there's algorithms and there's just persistence. and There's being a good writer. And it's yeah. just you can do all the tricks. But at the end of the day, 90% of the reason people aren't getting sponsored, aren't getting famous, is because they don't have the athletics to back it up. He had that okay. really. And I'll, I'll actually, I've never talked about this. There was like a very weird moment of just silent tension of like the day I got to big sky when we skied the little cooler yeah. and this is before I'd skied it. Um, for a while I thought I was going to be the youngest person to do it. And yeah. I saw an Instagram post on the plane and it was Kai when he was 11 mm -hmm. skiing the little cooler. And I'm just like, Oh my God, if we, if we don't do it this trip and this 11 year old kid has skied it, like, it's, it's going to hurt my soul a little bit and like happy for him. You know, I, it's not a competition for me. I wanted to ski it because it was my dream. If it happened when I was sure. 49, I would have held it in the same regard. Yeah. But at the same time, it was just like, Oh my God, this kid like can't even walk to the store by himself. Like, and he's skied the thing that I'm dreaming about. That's messed up. <laughs> you know, he, so, he, He's nasty, that kid. Mm -hmm. Not gonna lie, but that's sub but that's subjective because <laughs> I'm reading this book and I'm like, dude, I I couldn't imagine at 12 doing what you were doing, at 15 doing what you were doing, at 18 doing what you were doing. Now I make a lot of self-deprecating jokes about not being good. I'm decent. I can keep up with most folks. I stay off moguls because my knees hurt too much, and I stay out of the trees because I just. It, uh, you know, yeah, I say there's no such thing as luck, but sometimes I believe mm -hmm. in that there is. Um, but I, I will ski trees now and again. And then I see what you're doing. I'm like, holy smokes, this kid was born for this, according to the story. Now, that's his dad's story, so it could be embellished. I don't know. It's not. I wish it was. I mean, I think if he if we come up in a ski town and he raced, you know, he might be a more he would have gotten to be a more technically proficient skier quicker. I mean, he learned by watching my terrible technique, which was awful, and he self-taught himself much better. And then we got better coaching as, as he got into some of the travel. Uh, but even back then, I thought I might lose him to the park because the park kids with these, you know. There was never I, and a I, And I was so glad when I didn't. But even in the beginning, he just loved going where nobody else was going. He would We would go to Loon, and he would cut through these little patch of trees and end up in this shitty little run He'd be cutting through bushes and he'd come it out 10 minutes yeah. later and he'd be so happy. You know? <laughs> be like, Why wouldn't you want to stay in this beautiful open groomer and go hundred miles an hour? Isn't this so much more fun than what you're doing? No, he wanted to just go where, where other people either couldn't go or, or just weren't going. And, and from every mountain we went to, that was your goal to, to really ski where, where most people couldn't go. I think that's just part of your personality. It's more of an explorer type personality. I would say I was born to be an adventurer, you know, there you go. I, I, there's kids who grow up and they play doctor. There's kids who grow up and they play house. The, I was the kid. I was like, cool. I want to, I want to go to Mars when I grow up. I want to fly fighter jets when I grow up. And it was like, it Love was going to be something. Um, and it, I happened to land on skiing, but it's just like, I always like the draw of the unknown pulled me in a way that I couldn't run away from. I just, when I saw a single track going into the woods and, you know, when you're seven, the, the, the back country of Loon Mountain looks huge. You know, now sure. I've, I've, I've scratched every inch of it and it feels like a neighborhood to me now. But when you look right. out at the ski area boundary 
you know, not patrolled sign and you see tracks going there and you look out at the wilderness of the White Mountains and you're like, how far do those go? The curiosity pulls you. But then there's the fear of like, what happened if I got lost back there? What if I find something that I don't know how to tangle with? What if, you know, I end up on a huge cliff? Um, the, the balance of the fear um, and the pull of the exploration was always just something that I danced between. And sure. as I as I grew older and I started to learn tactics to deal with things, then you start getting comfortable with more unknown. You're like, okay, whatever I think I could find out there, I have all the tools to deal with it now. When I was seven, I didn't. Now that I'm 12, I have this many. Now that I'm 20, I have this many. Now you put me in like where I am now. I'm like, cool. Any patch of snow that I want to ski I'll find a way to ski it. I'll repel into it. I'll repel out of it. I don't know if I need to nail pitons or an ice screw or like sling a tree to make the anchor. I don't know if I'm going to have to like, you know, wedge the tails of my skis and like walk down under this chalk stone. But like, sure. I think I can see any patch of snow that I want to, the, whether or not the conditions are right when you want that is um, <clears throat> like, you know, up for that, that moment. But when they're right, that's what I like to do. And that was kind of what separated me from, from Kai and from, from some of these other people is that I was never the kid who jumped off of things. I was never the kid who was going to do the best trick in the park, was going to, you know, lace the gates the fastest. I was, a, I was a really good explorer and I just had a mind for it. I just craved exploration and I, and I could put a turn anywhere. I might not link the turns in the most cleanest, most beautiful way that's going to be cool to watch on film, but no matter what slope you put me on, if skis fit, I'll find a way to put a turn on it. So that's my thing, Love you know? <clears throat> Love it. Love it. And to reiterate, he knows how to do this, so don't anybody think he's just willy-nilly throwing himself off the side of a mountain. But that's part of the story, too, um, and that's the part that leads into the future, man. How's How's education? Oh man, that's a great question. How is education? Um, <laughs> it, it's really interesting. I um I love my outdoor out pro my outdoor ed program so much. I, I quote awesome. it all the time. Now that I'm kind of out guiding this summer, I find myself just using things we learned, the ideas of why we need all of these things. I was just talking about exploration, adventure, nature, um, and why it's worth it to take the risk. You know, I, I find myself walking down hills to these cliffs and um, talking to parents about rock climbing. And I'm just like, you know, like, this is a great thing for kids because it's perceived risk. And it's, it's if it's done right, it looks dangerous and feels dangerous, but it's not. Um, the drive to the trailhead is probably way more dangerous. And the words I just gave you, I couldn't uh, have articulated those words without the outdoor ed program. Sure. That was the benefit of it. I knew those things just kind of in my mind, but being able to vocalize them, that's what you learn in a program like that. The downside is that it's, it's a, it's a liberal arts school. There's gen eds. I'm, I'm going to have to take a guitar class this fall to graduate with a degree in outdoor ed. <laughs> and Interesting. I have I, I love music. It's fascinating to me. I'm not somebody who makes music. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, I get yeah, it. Yeah, you know? I um, get it. <clears throat> and also, the way that my life has progressed, like, I school is like, I look at it like I look at a challenging ski line. I have to break it into these, like, obstacles and hit it like a strike mission. Like, oh, we need to get up and down this mountain before the sun hits it. Because the last two semesters I've lost at least three weeks of school both times over the exam period sure. for life-changing expeditions. And these are not like, Oh, you know, I just want to go skiing. It's like my life will be in a vastly different place after this expedition, whether it's like things I learn, whether it's like just experiences, like how I'll feel after having seen and done that. Um, and the fact of just scarcity that like, if I pass it up, it might never happen again. So mm. I find myself doing all of my school doubled up so I can get it done a month early and like making bargains with teachers and having to drop things and then take them in the next semester. So 
I haven't had a typical college experience, but I'm hey. grateful for what I've gotten out of it. And it's I an atypical, atypical. Uh, atypical parenting experience <laughs> on the college side. When your kid calls and says, Dad, I can go to Baffin Island. Uh, Cody Townsend's going to be on the trip. And, you know, we're going to have this, you know, adventure. And, oh, oh by the way, but I'm going to miss exams. But I think I can, I think I can make it happen if I, <laughs> but, you know, like, you sure you can make it? How are you going to do this? No, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. So it always not- finds a way. Oh, and so <laughs> sometimes you got to just trust. And, and if the worst thing was you had to take an extra class, uh, you know, trust me, the Baffin Island trip, is he's going to remember a lot more than he's going to remember, you know, English 101 or whatever the heck you're taking. I was going to say, it- Baffin Island is one of those places a lot of people couldn't even tell you where it is. I couldn't. And ever. you get to go. That's awesome. Yeah, to heck with school. I didn't say that, but yes, yep. I did. No, you <laughs> should. It's it's. You learned a lot more on that trip, I'm sure. Do you so, want to talk about it at all? <laughs> what was it like? What did you learn? Yeah, what was it like? Go for it. Baffin um, Island. Let's get a scoop. Oh, my God. I could do a whole po- podcast just on that. Um, Essentially, the way I'll explain it. So it's... um. It's in the Arctic. It's an island, not at the tippity top of Canada, but the next one down from the tippity top on the East Coast. Uh, It's a fjord, which are these sort of glacial features where water kind of goes into the mountains. It's uh, seawater. So it's like, um, you know, imagine if you had Alaskan mountains, but like on Cape Cod. Uh, That's kind of what it's like. Uh, And these mountains are particularly special because... They're all very steep, very clean granite faces, um, somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000 feet. So we're talking like the things people drive out to Yosemite in huge campers and pay park fees just to look at. Sure. They're twice as many as there are in Yosemite and bigger. And they don't even have names. And between these rock features are clean coulars. And it's like, you think of the coulars in the world and you're like, okay, like there's longer ones. There's like the stuff in Chamonix, but like the Chamonix stuff, it's glaciated and it has repels. These are just snow. They're just snow hallways that you just have to walk up and ski down and they go right to the ocean. So there's no approach. It's as steep at the start as it is at the top. And it stays that way the whole way. Wow, dude. Be A lot of them are North facing. So they don't get sun affected even when the sun's warm. So they stay permanently good snow. So you're either going to ski chalk or powder. Um, you're just like, literally you're balancing. Do I want to rip this thing? Like just pin the fall line and just enjoy this good snow. Or do I want to ski it in hop turns so I can look at these walls while I'm doing it? The drawbacks, yeah. it's nearly impossible to get to. Unless you have just a logistical house of cards where if you pull one, the whole trip comes down. And you have to sleep next to one of the greatest North American predators, um, the polar bear. Yeah. That's and my thing. It, we dealt with that in Svalbard, but not like this. Like, it's weird to be climbing huge mountains. And the most scared you are is when you lay your head to rest at night in the tent. <laughs> Because a damn polar bear gonna come out and take care of you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and was, we had uh, we had Andy with us. He was our Inuit guide, and he um, he had hunted polar bears. Sure. And I'm like, okay. like you know, on on that um, Svalbard trip, we had Todd. I'm sure Todd's a great shot, but like, if I got someone who's got polar bear bodies on him, like, man, that's who I want defending me. <laughs> so when you run into a black bear, then here in New England, it's not such a big deal anymore. You pet that thing like a dog. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I run into a black bear in New England. Like, oh, so have I. I was close enough that I could hear it breathing, and it ran away from me. <laughs> yeah. It's a whole different. Not going to do that. <laughs> no, no. I tell people that all the time. Like, what about the bears? Like, what about them? We got black bears. So what? It's not like we got grizzly bears or polar bears. Man, you get to see all the cool stuff. That was something else in the book, actually. While while I have it in mind, you know who who was it and who said it to who? I can't remember. Something about just take a look around or yep, make sure yep. you look Andrew, around. Andrew Andrew Eisenstar is a pretty legendary guide. Uh, he he was that was addressed to me because I would whine the whole way up in Antarctica and I would start complaining and asking for how how much longer how much longer. Good boy. And he would just yell back, you know, don't forget to look around. And and he's right. I mean, you look around and it's 
Antarctica is just, it's, it's silent and there's just the icebergs move and the penguins, you hear some squawking, but that's about it. And it's just mesmerizing. And if you don't enjoy the, the going up, you're missing half of it. You know, it's, it's not the two minutes down because the runs are short going down. It, yeah. It's a couple of hours up that you should enjoy more than anything. And it took me till the second trip. Honestly, we went back this last time and I, I'm a little lighter than I was the first trip and I trained a little harder and I was, I enjoyed it much better. So. Ryan could attest there's it. that but there's also the biggest thing was your mindset mental was different. yeah it's true because right it's just for starters i mean i don't think we climbed enough mountains for you, you to even know how it feels like yep. i think it's very easy when you are like when you have that excuse of like oh i'm just out of shape to look at everybody else and be like they don't even feel this this is just easy and i'm the only one this is hard for like i hate going uphill too yeah you yeah. know it's like if you, you feel sweaty, you feel smarmy, you like you are thinking about like, oh my God, it's so much longer from the top. You're thirsty, you're stripping off layers and you're putting them back on. It's not comfortable. But if you can accept that it's not comfortable and accept that the discomfort's temporary, now all of a sudden you have a new space. Because when you're skiing, you look at things like a million miles an hour. When you're walking up, you have enough time to process, oh my God, that iceberg, look at how weird it's shaped and it's so blue. Like you take in that stuff more. Yep. And yeah. I think once you knew that and, and for, for him, it was like, that was such a passion trip. He talked about it for like a year leading up to it. And we had to bring triples of every piece of gear. The bags were like a hundred pounds because he just didn't want to even face the possibility of losing something and not getting to ski. And it was cool because I've never seen him get that way about skiing sure. before. And I could tell that the place had had an impact on him. Yeah. And he was just so excited to have the opportunity to be back there. He did more runs than we did. Yeah, I mean, time. granted, I was with a, a client group and they had different, you know, goals. But sure. like, I'm like, you did three laps today? Like, that's like the most vert you've ever done. And he wasn't even like, oh, my God, it sucked. He was like, it was great. We could have done more. Yeah, no, it's it's worth it. I'd go back, to, I'd go back again. I mean, if it was, you know, wasn't so damn expensive, I'd, I'd go back every year. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not a trip you can take, you know, once in a lifetime kind of trip. We happen to do it twice because Ryan got the guide the second time. Ryan, I'm sure, will go back multiple times. I, I hope I go back again one, one more time. It would be great for me. If See, four of you want to um, reach out to me uh, in any way, I'm sure we'll we'll plug the socials at the end of this. True, if anyone's um, listening and they want to go, yeah, anybody wants to go to Antarctica, um, no, no like extensive ski resume is necessary. If you like walking uphill and like skiing downhill, um, you can you can hire me, and if I get four of you, I get to go on the trip for free. So there's there's that option. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if you, you might. I would love to say my audience is so extensive that you will definitely get it. I can't say that guaranteed, but, man, you definitely got a few people thinking or listening to this right now. Like, you know, I could not buy the new Bronco and I can go do this. <laughs> exactly. That's about it. Yep. Shout out to those yep. who did buy it. Yep. And, I mean, I would go. That's too much of a trip for me. I know my limitations. I hate flying, and I get seasick wicked bad, not to mention altitude sickness. Believe me, I'm a mess. I, I loved how somebody in the book, one or the other, brought up something about use the word constitution. And I had to chuckle because mine is weak. Um, I got yep. it in the brain minus the memory. It's the body. That's not no, that's spirit it. is willing, but the body is. Yep. Mess. So well, but locally, if you and a lot of New Englanders listen to this, I mean, Ryan, yeah. if you ever have questions about the presidential range, this kid knows every single inch of every trail. I mean, it's incredible what he's done locally and, you know, when you watch the videos and most people have seen Tuckerman's or done Tuckerman's have gone up there once, you know, there's what I've discovered through him is there's 10,000 other runs you could do that nobody really knows. So I mean, he's, he's your guy locally as well. All right. So here's the question then. Mm -hmm. Tuckerman ravine is famous. I've never yeah. done it. Um, I hear so many different things. I've had people like, dude, I can go rock that tomorrow. And that's what they've heard. I've heard people say it's wicked dangerous. Don't even bother. And I had a friend of mine tell me about how when they just did the hike and was throwing up at the top of the hike. So um, shout out, Alex. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it was a good story. What is it really like? Let's get the first hand. Like I've talked to people. I want you. You I want you to tell me because you're the guy, not just some dude. Tuckerman Ravine. I mean, 
it's it's hard to say that any other way you know it, it giveth and it taketh away like it depends on the day you're there it has moods those moods are extreme um this year mount washington the summit which is about maybe 700 feet higher than the top of tuckerman ravine was the coldest place on earth it had a negative 108 degree wind chill and for those like i don't even know how to explain that to people like if it was 108 degrees outside you you could die from overheating. Now put that in reverse. Put that go to zero. Think about how cold you are in zero. Then add that to 108. No one of us have ever felt that. And if we did, we wouldn't live to tell the tale. No. Two weeks later, we were laying on rocks in beautiful sunshine with no wind, and we're like thinking about taking our shirts off. So. You really, you can't mess with the weather on that mountain, but the weather isn't always bad. It can be so nice. It can be such a friendly place. You just have to pick your days. Um, I personally think most people ski Tuckerman Ravine way too late in the season. I think around mid-March, it starts to peak. We get uh, longer high-pressure windows, so the snow stability is a little bit more frequent. The sun is stronger, so you start to get the corn snow, which is soft. You can ski it in midwinter snow, but it's kind of that wind-hammered chalk you might have felt at like the top of Jay Peak, or if you've sure. been out west, Kirkwood has a lot of that. Um, maybe like Palisades, like you'll you'll feel it. Um, that can be a little bit scary on the steep runs in Tuckerman Ravine because they are steeper than anything you'll do in the resort. Sure. When you get the the sun effect from the corn. Um, it has a little bit more bite to it. You can push the snow around. If you fall on it, it's more forgiving. That thing has a remarkable way of spitting people out in the most violent ways when they fall and not having them sustain any injuries. People just get up. And that's why we have so many videos that are funny and not scary. Sure. Um, The walk-in, it's a bit of a walk. But like I said, if you do it when in like March or early April, there's still snow all the way to the parking lot. Yeah. So you can ski in or you can walk up with your ski boots on and then you can ski all the way to the bottom. When you do it in May, it's this really novel thing. But um, the problem is you're now walking with your skis and your boots on your back and you're finishing your skiing and then you're walking back down and all of a sudden you feel like you've hiked a section of the Appalachian Trail. It's like kind of it's kind of grueling. Like I start thinking about rock climbing when it gets like that. Sure. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my stance on it. I think the head wall is really hyped. If you're a timid skier, you should ski right gully or, um, left gully, maybe lobster claw. If you're like really getting into it, that still counts. Those are still like a valid tick of Tuckerman ravine. If you sure. want to like go, you did it. But, um, if you want the head wall, it's one of the few things that's that steep that you can ski carving turns and not hop turns on. And the long leg, short leg is insane. You feel like your uphill knees and your chest and your downhill leg might run away from you. If you have the skill and the the know-how to ski that it's a run that you'll always remember. There's a reason it's so classic. That's my spiel. Fair enough. Um, when I'm ready to do it and my friends are ready to do it, we're going to call you and have you take a look first. And then <laughs> you can tell us how bad we are. And then you can decide if we could survive it or not. Um, lots, of, lots of resources, too, for other listeners. Uh, if you were thinking about going, go to Mount Washington Avalanche Center and just totally. read the report. Maybe even read a couple reports from a few days before because it'll tell you what's happening in the moment. But sometimes you can identify a trend. So like if yesterday it was high, then the next day it was considerable. Now today it's moderate. Um, and it's going to be sunny with no wind, um, but not super hot, sunny for the next three days. And on the third day you're thinking of going, it's probably going to keep trending to low, but if it's continuously gone up, if it was low yesterday, now it's moderate and a huge snowstorm's coming in it's probably going to go to considerable or high. So look at the reports, identify the trends, please check the weather, bring layers you don't think you're going to need, um, and just like be ready for a day out. Cool. I love it, man. I love it. I'm not, I don't know anything about that world, really. Um, but that's why I'm in this is to learn stuff. You know, I'm not going to go pro like you are and you have been 
in, in, a, in, in many ways. And again, read the book, everybody, without restraint, uh, How Skiing Saved My Son's Life. And you can get all into Robert and Ryan's story. And then if you're scared to do things in New England, you call Ryan up. He'll take you out and he'll show you how to do it. Just make sure you bring your checkbook. The boy's not working for free. We're not doing that. That's Except okay. unless you want to do free for me, and that's different, whatever. Yes, you're free. All right, boys, let's, uh, <laughs> let's do some plugs. Without restraint, How Skiing Saved My Son's Life. Available in all the usual places, I assume. Everywhere, yep. Uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, local bookshops. Uh, the audio book is out as well. If you're not a, a reader, and I'm, and honestly, I, I, I'm more of an audio book guy myself. I listened to it. I, it, I thought it was great. The, uh, the, there's the two narrators. There's a Rob and there's a Ryan, and I think they did a nice job. And they're a little oh, more cool. dramatic than we are when we, when we read it. They're professionals at it. It's, it's very listenable, and it's, it's a, it's a good one. And it's on Kindle and every other place. Did I forget any, Ray? Um, it's hard to forget anywhere. I mean, it'd be harder to find a, uh, a shop or like a online thing that you'd expect to sell books that doesn't sell it. Yep. We're not in certain store locations or like if you have like a niche bookstore, we're probably not going to be in there, but like anywhere you could think to find it on the internet, you're going to find it. Yep. I'll drop Ooh. it off at your house if you want. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm available. There you go. We'll deliver Give the man something to do, everybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just make sure you have coffee. If you want, exactly. you want coffee, whatever you yep. want. Exactly. Um, you want a beer, whatever you want. I don't yep. know. I quit sign drinking. It. Yep. There you go. There you go. Who doesn't love autographs? I love autographs. I got them both. Yep. So there you go. Uh, any social kind of stuff, websites, anything you want to get out there, kids? More him than sure. me. <laughs> yeah, you can find me on on Instagram at extreme underscore Ryan underscore Delena. Um, and that's where you'll get the most of me. Um, I post stories, uh, what I'm doing the day of, and then I do kind of longer posts where I'll, you know, do highlights. Um, if you just want to flip through the photos, I usually put the caption as what it is. If you want to know everything about it, you can push that more tab and you're going to get about five paragraphs. I do YouTube too, just Ryan Delena. There's like a few other Ryan Delenas, but like I'm the one that like does ski things. Um, <laughs> you can, if you want to watch like sort of longer, like 10 minute kind of narrative style edits of like the stuff we do, um, you can see those. And you can even, if you're reading the book right now or plan on reading it, you can still find videos of stuff we talk about in the book from like years ago. I haven't awesome. taken them down. So you can kind of follow a along for my, my visual people. Uh, and then lastly, if you want to read uh, trip reports and things of that sort, you can find me on Substack as just Ryan Delena. Um, I have a free subscription open because I don't feel important enough to, to charge you money uh, <laughs> to read things I write. I love it. So yeah, yeah real awesome. quick, I'm not as prolific on social media, but I, I can be found pretty easily. Uh, Robert Delena on Instagram or on um, on Facebook. I have heard from a lot of parents, and that's why I bring it up of struggling kids, and it's been really rewarding. It's stressful sometimes to hear those stories and offer advice because I mean I can tell you what not to do, and I made every mistake. I think I can't always tell you what you should do, but instinctively I, I think I'm in a position to to maybe you know, dole out some advice. And if nothing else, dole out some hope. I think most people in that position when their kids are struggling, they just want to hear that it might turn out okay. And I have the perfect living, breathing example uh, who sleeps in my house sometimes that, that it can turn awesome. out okay. So reach out. If Absolutely. you want to see like every example, like an archive file of just all the times I didn't know a picture of me was being taken until I saw a camera in my face. You should follow his Instagram. Yeah, I got a lot. I got a lot of more awesome. of Ryan from behind. You get a lot of. <laughs> hey, the back of the head is still the head. That's what I always exactly. say. Awesome. So help reach out to him. Um, I'm glad Ryan, you brought up the fact that your videos are still up. I did mean to ask that, and I forgot, and I didn't write it down. Um, so yeah, follow along because he talks about a few different ones throughout the years, and that might be kind of cool to go take a trip down memory lane with the book. And the book is really enjoyable. Like I said. 
there's so many different stories in one book coming from two people. You can look at it as a parenting tale. You can look at it as a ski tale. You can look at it as a backcountry tale, a New Englander tale, an adventure story. Uh, uh, you know, you could actually get some sitcom out of it. I could rewrite some of this into a sitcom. Yep. Um, I wouldn't because I don't know. I, now that I say it, it's kind of disrespectful. No, Sorry, no, boys. There's I didn't a lot mean of laughs that. in there. I mean, I laugh uh, at myself more than anybody. It, there's some funny parts there for sure. There, there definitely are, and it is wonderful. Without restraint. Go ahead and look in the uh, description. You will find all the links they talked about. I'll go find it on Amazon. Put that link in there. I'll make sure it's all there for you all to find very easily. Read it. Uh, put it in your summer reading list. If not, read it on the gondola or on the chair. Um, I don't know. I had lifties who used to read books and then just hand them to me. He's like, dude, I'm done with this. Take it. And I'm like, all yes. right. Maybe that'll happen, too. Share the wealth, man. Thank you, gentlemen. Dude, this was awesome. And uh, when you move on to the next thing, your next big adventure, your next book, Ryan, if you start writing guidebooks, that's fine, too. Call me up. We'll talk. What do you say? Thank you. That would be awesome. I would love to write a guidebook sometime. Somebody else wrote the one I wanted to write, but now I'm trying to ski everything in his guidebook. So (laughs) uh, we'll see. We'll see what it evolves to. But I appreciate you very much. You asked great questions. You didn't um, get mad at me for rambling on for five minutes straight, so you're patient. You're a good host, man, and I was stoked to get to have this conversation with you. Awesome, and I appreciate it. Let me break a fourth wall for you all. Every podcast host, every radio host in history loves when the guest talks. That's less we have to do, and it's wonderful. We <laughs> We're love good at you that part. We make that. that very easy. No, just, <clears throat> just hit record, and we'll go. I love it. Thank you, guys. I do appreciate it, and uh, we'll see you out there. Actually, I do have some news, but even when this comes out, it might be announced. It might not be, but I just want to brag that I know something that you all don't, but you might know it by now, so whatever. Anyway, guys, have a good night, y'all. Thank you so much. Sweet. And there you have it, the authors of the book, Without Restraint, How Skiing Saved My Son's Life, Robert and Ryan Delana from this past summer, and we heard from them again at the Snowbound Expo, which is the news I was talking about at the end of that. I knew they were speaking at Snowbound um, before it was released. I, I was just got to, because I was talking to them, we knew it, but we couldn't say it. You know how that goes. Everything's good, though. They got there. They set up their booth. They had their books. They had their merch. So much merch. I did not expect that. Uh, now you could actually go to Ryan Delana's um, Instagram and find the link for their merch shop. Pick up some of that stuff. I have some of that stuff. It's very cool. Very, very cool indeed. And that, of course, includes the book. You can buy a copy of the book hardcover signed by the authors if you weren't able to get the snowbound and get them to sign your copy in person, right? Right. Thank you for listening to the Ski Rex Media Podcast, even though it is a bit of a repeat, but hey, it's good information, and I really like the delay, as we have a lot of fun, me and, me and those guys, so this is worth doing again. I, of course, am Tim from Ski Rex Media, asking you to subscribe to the Ski Rex Media Podcast. You can hear it on Podbean, the Podbean app. Of course, that is my host. You can also find it on your favorite uh, podcast app or platform. Apple Music or Apple Podcasts, I mean, not Apple Music. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, until that's not a thing anymore. Um, Spotify, Pandora, all those places, search for the Ski Rex Media Podcast. You can also go to Ski Rex Media, po- uh, no, no, you can go to skirexmedia.com and you can listen to the podcast on my website as well as request stickers, sign up for the newsletter. When the merch shop for Ski Rex Media reopens, you'll be able to check that out. Contact information, the Speak Pipe link, new this season, Speak Pipe link. You click on this, it's a service that allows you to send voicemail to Ski Rex Media. How awesome is that? You can send me comments, questions, concerns, queries. You can send me shout outs to give to other people for their birthday or their anniversary. You can tell me I suck. You can do whatever you want on there. And I may, not only may I answer it on the podcast, but it's a good bet I'll put the audio on the podcast as well. Speak pipe link. It's right on the middle of the page. All you got to do is tap it, record your voicemail. I'll get that. Plus, you can send an email to Ski Rex Media, contact at skirexmedia.com, or you can DM me through the various social media platforms. Right? Right. I am Tim from Ski Rex Media. Thank you for listening again. I'll see you on the next one, which will be a new one later. Later.